Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for GoDaddy's third quarter 2020 earnings call. I'm Mark Grant, Vice President of Investor Relations. With me today are Aman Bhutani, Chief Executive Officer, and Ray Winborn, Chief Financial Officer. Following prepared remarks, we'll open up the call for your questions. If you'd like to ask a question on today's call, please use the raise hand feature in the webinar to be added to the queue. On today's call, we'll be referencing both GAAP and non-GAAP financial results and operating metrics, such as total bookings, unlevered free cash flow, normalized EBITDA, net debt, gross merchandise volume, and annualized recurring revenue. A discussion of why we use non-GAAP financial measures and reconciliations of our non-GAAP financial measures to their GAAP equivalents may be found in the presentation posted to our investor relations website at investors.godaddy.net or on our Form 8K filed with the SEC with today's earnings release. The matters we'll be discussing today include forward-looking statements, which include those related to our future financial results, new product introductions and innovations, partner integrations, our ability to integrate acquisitions and achieve desired synergies, as well as the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our business, customers, and employees. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that are discussed in detail in our documents filed with the SEC. Actual results may differ materially from those contained in the forward-looking statements. Any forward-looking statements that we make on this call are based on assumptions as of today, November 4, 2020, and we undertake no obligation to update these statements as a result of new information or future events unless required by law. With that, here's Amon. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all for joining us. Today, I am excited to share the details on a record quarter for GoDaddy. Before we get started, though, I want to announce a change to our leadership team. Andrew Loaki, our Chief Operating Officer, is leaving GoDaddy, effective November 13th, after nearly a decade with the company. As a colleague and friend, I am grateful for his significant contributions over the years. He was a key part of building the great company we have today, and I wish him all the best in his new adventure, which will be announced over the next few days. We stand today with a deep leadership bench, including both tenured and new leaders, organized to deliver on the needs of our customers and our strategic priorities. With this full complement of leaders in place, we will make a few adjustments, but we will not backfill the COO role. This will allow for a seamless transition so we can stay focused on executing against our strategy. And every day, our passion for that strategy grows as more entrepreneurs trust and partner with GoDaddy to start with a dream and then create and grow that dream. We are pleased with our progress, and today I would like to highlight three key areas. First, our strong execution against our strategy with a few notable milestones. Second, our continued progress in online presence solutions, including leaning into commerce capabilities. And third, our continued investment in marketing to capture demand. Q3 was another record quarter of customer growth, and we are seeing sustained momentum into October. In Q3, we once again added over 400,000 net new customers while also seeing improved customer retention. We continue to see increased demand for online solutions due to the pandemic and coupled with higher marketing spend, our website traffic has increased by an average of 20% year over year since April. We have seen increased adoption of our website creation platform, websites plus marketing and managed WordPress, as well as our content and commerce tools over and sell bright. As an additional insight into this part of the business, we are excited to share that together these solutions reached an annualized recurring revenue of nearly 350 million in Q3, growing at approximately 40% year over year. This group of products now accounts for more than 2.2 million subscriptions, growing over 20% year over year. Additionally, this quarter, we saw an acceleration of Cellbrite's GMV growth. Between websites plus marketing and Cellbrite, GoDaddy now has more than $4.5 billion of annualized GMV transacting through our platform. 
growing at nearly 80% year over year. These proof points reinforced our strategy of driving scale in the grow phase for customers by focusing on commerce. Business applications as a product line continued to accelerate in the third quarter, surpassing the milestone of 3 million customers with nearly 9 million seats of email. Best of all, these numbers continue to grow at a healthy pace. While we're pleased with the growth in these key areas, we're not resting on our laurels. We're driving product enhancements and increasing our marketing efforts to facilitate profitable long-term growth. We continue to charge towards the massive opportunities of content creation and commerce. This quarter, we accomplish this through deep partnership integrations, internally developed software releases, and an important commerce acquisition. In partnerships, we recently announced a deeper integration with Facebook's business extension. GoDaddy websites plus marketing customers can now create shoppable posts as well as set up shops on both Instagram and Facebook with automatic syncing between both platforms, offering yet another channel for our customers to easily sell their products. Additionally, our new partnership with Vimeo allows customers to upload, preview, and insert videos, including using a video as a header to their website. We've also continued to accelerate our velocity internally, delivering a busy product launch schedule in the quarter. We released a full integration of our over app within Websites Plus Marketing a short few months into the acquisition, making it even easier for customers to market their businesses with creative content. The seamlessly intuitive experience has driven over 50% growth in posts. We've also extended the over app across 12 new languages, giving more customers access to this powerful set of tools. Additionally, GoDaddy released a powerful social composer dashboard in Websites Plus Marketing, giving customers a single place to rapidly create polished social content and view and schedule their social posts across connected social media platforms. What's more, users can track the performance metrics of each post by platform. We also introduced a simple and intuitive one-page e-commerce template in Websites Plus Marketing, which has quickly become our most popular template, and it has reduced time to publish for our customers by 40%. Continuing on the theme of commerce, we launched our online store capabilities in Argentina, Peru, Colombia, and Chile, positioning GoDaddy to serve customers in these markets. We also continue to innovate for our domains customers. In Q3, we introduced revamped bulk search and file upload tools for domain investors and rolled out free global who is masking and a new paid security services with greater domain protections. And we are super excited to welcome the Skyverge team. With nearly 60 WooCommerce extensions spanning payments, email marketing, and membership, Skyverge is a leading WooCommerce product developer. This acquisition furthers our commitment in WordPress to help entrepreneurs and web professionals succeed online with high-performance stores that are feature-rich and quick to build. Lastly, in Q2, we talked about our plan to delever marketing for as long as we continue to see returns on our investment. While the investment increased, we also delivered another record quarter for both customer ads and total cohort size. Obviously, it's something we're quite pleased to see, particularly as we've coupled these strong marketing gains alongside the great product enhancements we've talked about today. In closing, our focus is to build simple and easy to use tools with a focus on helping everyday entrepreneurs succeed. Online commerce and marketing are areas where this need has become significantly more pronounced in 2020. We are seeing rapid adoption of these new tools, giving us the opportunity to help more customers succeed. Solid execution in an elevated demand environment powered a strong third quarter. We are poised for sustainable, profitable, long-term growth, and we continue to be confident in our ability 
to hit our 411 target in 2022. With that, here's Ray. Hey, thanks, Amon. I'll touch on the financial results for what was a great quarter for GoDaddy and then provide our outlook for Q4. Q3 reflected a strong performance across the board with another record quarter of customer growth and acceleration in top line growth and margin expansion. And new customer bookings continue to hit records. While small relative to total bookings, they're an important contributor to future growth. We've also continued to experience low customer churn rates and resiliency in subscription renewal rates, proof points to the durability of the business model. Total revenue came in at $844 million, growing 11% year over year while currency impacts were negligible. Growth rates accelerated across all three product categories and re-accelerated in our international business. Business applications was our fastest growing product line, increasing 19% year over year on continued strength in branded email and productivity solutions. We delivered 12% growth in domains across new registrations, strong renewals, and aftermarket sales. And finally, hosting and presence grew 6%. Inside that, Amon highlighted the tremendous growth in products comprising our website creation platforms. In contrast, it also reflects a headwind from the GoDaddy social product due to the elimination of the outbound sales force in June. Total bookings grew to $945 million rising 11% year over year while currency impacts were negligible. Strength in bookings was broad based across products and geographies as our brand and product offerings positioned us well to capture demand as businesses continue their digital transformation. For many small businesses, establishing an online presence was once seen as a competitive advantage. It's now table stakes. Gross margin came in at 66% in the quarter a 40 basis point expansion year over year. We also delivered operating leverage as the June restructuring actions reduced cost and care while G&A continued to benefit from both scale and lower discretionary expenses. As we highlighted on the second quarter call, we stepped up our investment in marketing to capture market demand, resulting in a $36 million year over year increase in marketing expense. We've been able to elevate our investment while remaining within our target month to break even and customer acquisition costs, even as we saw increased competition in performance advertising channels. And we'll continue to invest in marketing as long as we're meeting our return metrics. The net sum resulted in normalized EBITDA of $199 million in Q3, or approximately two points of margin expansion over last year. Moving to cash flow, unlevered free cash flow for the quarter was $224 million, growing 17% year over year with margin expansion of over a point. Trailing 12-month unlevered free cash flow was over $800 million and margin topped 25%, illustrating both the size and scale of this business. Now, on to the balance sheet. We finished Q3 with $622 million in cash and total liquidity of over $1.2 billion. We were able to capitalize on favorable market conditions, issuing a new $750 million seven-year term loan with an all-in yield of 2.7%, a record for a double B-rated company. With this issuance, net debt stands at $2.5 billion, or about three times net leverage on a trailing 12-month basis. That's the middle of our targeted range of two to four times. And we have no significant debt maturities until 2024. In view of our ability to deleverage, this leaves more than ample liquidity to fund the business, execute the strategy, and pursue our stated capital allocation priorities. Now I want to take a moment to reiterate that any potential increases to the corporate tax rate will not have an immediate impact on GoDaddy's cash flow. As a reminder, given our net operating loss position, we don't expect to pay U.S. cash taxes before 2027. A higher corporate tax rate would, however, enhance the value of the recent settlement of the TRA. For example, a 28% rate increases the future tax savings associated with the TRA attributes by over $700 million, further enhancing the already strong returns on the settlement. The strength and resilience of our recurring business model has fueled a strong balance sheet and has enabled us to execute across our capital allocation priorities in 2020, including completing four acquisitions, repurchasing nearly 6% of our outstanding equity, and settling the TRA. 
we have the flexibility to take advantage of opportunity as it arises, and we'll continue to be prudent allocators of capital in pursuit of long-term growth and leverage free cash flow per share. With that, let's turn to our Q4 outlook. We expect total revenue of approximately $865 million, or 11% growth year over year. You should expect double-digit growth in domains, mid-single-digit growth in hosting and presence, and high teens growth in business applications. Remember, those products that relied on the outbound calling motion, like GoDaddy Social, disproportionately impact the hosting and presence line. On unlevered free cash flow, we expect 2020 to land at approximately $820 million, the midpoint of our previous guidance range. As a reminder, Q4 has a highly anomalous 27th pay period this year, without which our unlevered free cash flow guide would have been approximately $18 million higher. In closing, digital migration is definitely an accelerating trend and it's here to stay. Our business is well positioned to meet the needs of entrepreneurs around the globe as they bring their ideas to life online. GoDaddy has long been known as an industry leader with profitable growth at scale. Now, with a set of subscription software tools enabling websites, content creation, and commerce that's approaching $350 million in annual recurring revenue, we're as confident as we've ever been that we can continue to grow, take share, and generate significant cash flow. With that, we'll have Christy Masoner from our Investor Relations team open up the call for questions. Thanks, Ray. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of the webinar screen to be added to the queue and unmute your line. Our first question comes from the line of Jason Helstein at Oppenheimer & Company. Please go ahead. Unmuted, thank you. Um, so you notice 400,000 net ads in the, or over 400,000 net ads in the third quarter. Can you comment how the second quarter compared to this? And then um, when we think about versus a year ago, can you just comment on customer churn? Are you seeing, you know, higher or the same churn? And then secondly, um, appreciate the, the 350 million in ARR gross bookings. Um, you know, if we, if we uh, if, or the 350 million in ARR related to e-commerce, if we divide that into gross bookings, it's about 9%. Is that a reasonable way to think about kind of sizing the e-commerce business today relative to gross bookings? Thanks. Hey, Jason. Thanks for that question. This is Amon. Um, you know, when we look at the third quarter, it represents record organic net sub growth for GoDaddy. You know, we're, we're really happy with the progress here. And as we look at Q2, you know, like we said in some of our prepared remarks, October continued to be in line with September and did really well year over year as well. You know, in terms of churn rates, uh, they continue to be stable, slightly better. Uh, just going back to the idea that our customers truly are the everyday entrepreneurs and, you know, if they hit roadblocks, they, they're creative, they innovate and, and they start something else and, and get on with it. And then I'll turn it to Ray for maybe a little bit more color and to your second question on the 350. Hey, Jason, it's Ray. Um, ARR is not apples to apples, obviously with bookings, so it's cash versus uh, uh, revenue, but really happy with what we're seeing there from those products uh, from a bookings perspective as well, growing at, at relatively similar um, uh, levels. Our next question comes from the line of Nick Jones from Citibank. Please go ahead. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, could, could you touch on some of the integrations you, you talked about in the press release or uh, in the deck uh, today? You know, what kind of uses are you seeing or, or uh, by subs with these integrations, whether it's over uh, Instagram, Facebook? And then I guess the follow up on that is as you integrate all these uh these great products for subs like vimeo um you know skyverse things like that um how does that impact kind of the funnel for subscribers is it you know how, i guess how do you prevent them from getting confused by i guess all the options you're introducing thanks yeah let's uh let's take the specific examples you know from uh, from previous quarters and then i'll briefly touch on skyverge and how we look at the funnel um our goal bringing in over, bringing in the experience from uni registry was that we wanted to bring to the GoDaddy family 
companies, teams that were building amazing experiences for customers, sort of best in class experiences. And then we want to take those experiences and bring them into our mainstream products like websites plus marketing. So when we talk about over the integration, it, you know, it, it's all very new right now. So it's less about what subscriptions it's driving and it's more about what level of engagement we're getting from the functionality we're putting out there. For example, with, with the over integration, uh, there was a 50% increase in posts sort of content creation and people posting that content on social media, which shows immediate customer value. And that's, that's our core formula, right? We want to introduce these pieces whether it's Vimeo or others into the core experience at the right place. It's not, it's not early in the funnel. It's as these customers are using this, these products, it shows up in a simple way at the right place. And it's just intuitive for the customer to use it. And as we continue to create customer value, over time, we could turn it into shareholder value, you know, by sort of moving people through the tiers by taking pricing action and such. But but the first step is really creating customer value. And in terms of Skyverge, you know, it's it's the same formula. Skyverge team is fantastic in the WooCommerce space, and they have they have 60 plugins. They they just are completely focused on building the best experience for customers. And it's super new right now, but well, you can expect the same same thing from us from us that it will become part of our managed WordPress experience and it will just be simple for customers in terms of their commerce experience uh, with WooCommerce as well. To touch on the funnel just slightly, you know, keep in mind that as we add these capabilities, they are coming in at the right place where the customer is using the product. They, these things don't uh, sort of in a sense clutter the buying experience or the freemium experience in any way. In fact, if anything, as we layer on more and more capability and provide it as part of the freemium package, it, we feel it encourages people to use the product because they've got more functionality that they can use as part of the product. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from a line of Ron Josie from JMP Securities. Ron, please go ahead. Great, I think I'm unmuted. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, Great quarter, guys, and Amon, thank you for the additional details on, on the business metrics. I wanted to talk about commerce specifically and the four and a half billion in GMV and, and, and also the integrations with Facebook and Instagram, which you just talked about. But can you just talk about what tools you think are still needed to fully take advantage of this you know, commerce opportunity that you're seeing with the 80% growth in GMV? Um, or, or do you have, do you think you have a fully integrated approach now to fully take advantage? And then as a follow-up to that, um, can, can you talk about sort of, you know, we're, we're, we're two quarters into the freemium approach with web, websites and marketing, a quarter in with Cellbrite. Just talk how, how freemium has maybe changed the complexion of, of these new subs or these record new subs that are growing, to the, growing on the platform. Thank you. Yeah, happy to do that, Ron. Thanks for the question. You know, on the, on the first piece about, you know, the 350 and just the color, you know, we're super excited about the, that part of the business and how quickly it's growing. You know, uh, I think I'm blanking on the exact uh, word you said, but just to, on the second part of your question, you know, when I look at the subs growth, what I'm really focused on is, are we providing the customers the product that they can try out? And as an example, you mentioned Cellbrite. Cellbrite's doing really, really well, right? The GMV growth that we're seeing, you know, it's fantastic but it's because we're getting the product in the hands of customers and more and more merchants are quickly using Cellbrite. By the way, we're seeing the same in websites plus marketing. Premium means that more customers are using it. And yes, we're a couple of quarters in and what that's done is it's given us enough confidence that we are rolling the freemium piece out sort of 10 to 20% at a time. It's not 100% in the US yet as we get into every part of our website and our sales path, but that's the place we're going. In hey, Ron, it's, it's Ray. I want to clarify one point on that. Uh, within our customer count number does not include freemium. Those are paid only subscriptions. So that record organic growth is for paid subscriptions, not freemium. Yeah, and I'll also clarify the numbers that we gave for subscriptions. Uh, the 2.2 million doesn't include subscriptions for over or sell right. Those are core websites plus marketing and managed WordPress. And what we say, what we believe is that over in Cellbrite, sort of, you know, the customers use that as part of our core platform. And then you, you asked the question, I, sorry, back to me, around gaps, you know, in our offering. 
the commerce offering is driving a ton of that growth in those suite of products, right? So that's really fantastic. And we serve the needs of a certain set of customers really well already. The way I think about it is that as we grow to sort of off cover more and more customers, we are going to have to add feature set. But that's sort of an order of operations. Say, what's the next thing that we need to go after? And let's build that capability or buy that capability, put it in place, and then offer it to customers in as simple a way as possible. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from the, from the line of Egal Aranian from Wedbush Securities. Egal, please go ahead. Egal, please unmute your line. Oh, hey, uh, can you hear me now? We can. All right, great, thanks. Um, so I, I want to ask a, a couple of big picture questions. One, one related to, to commerce and what you're doing there. And obviously you're doing a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's a feature that you know, within your space is kind of growing, um, you know, pretty competitive uh, across the space. Um, you, know, you guys have always viewed yourselves as uh, focused on that, you know, micro businesses. That does what you're doing here, you know, when you think about Skyverge and Cellbrite, um, you know, integration into uh, Facebook and Instagram, um, how, how do you guys see yourself playing in, in that market, you know, in the, in the e-commerce specifically is it still kind of focused towards that um you know micro smb it just does that change any of your your philosophy in terms of go to market and, and who your target customer is and then related to that i think you know a lot of investors think of godaddy still very exposed to smbs which um which you are and i think that's um you know something maybe some people have a hard time getting over in terms of the risk from um, from COVID and, and businesses shutting down and, and the overall health. Uh, we saw in 3Q um, new, new business applications for, um, for SMBs, but really businesses in general were, were up over 50%. So there, there's a lot happening in that space too. Is there anything you know, you're seeing that gives you extra confidence? You, you know, Aman, you touched on uh, entrepreneurs and shutting down and, and, and reopening. Now, what are you seeing within businesses closing and opening and, and that overall environment that you know, gives you maybe more or less confidence than typical environments. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Igor. Let, let me address sort of the target customer, micro SMB commerce part of the question and then take some of the uh, pieces on, you know, turn and what exposure we see in the SMB space and then maybe Ray can touch on it too. Um, if we take a step back, Igor, what what we're seeing in the numbers is that customers, our customers, people that have great relationships with GoDaddy are coming to us and saying, I want a commerce offering from you. We, we shared with you a quarter or two ago that 25% of customers signing up for websites plus marketing are signing up for the commerce tier. These are people by themselves going there and saying, I want this this product from GoDaddy. So, you know, what, what we're focused on is when we see those early signals and we see people starting to click stuff, we're like, this is an offering that we have the right to serve, right? This is a target segment of customers that have the best relationship with us. Let's meet their needs. And my view on the competitive space and such is that there is so much opportunity still in the micro businesses in the everyday entrepreneur space that we define, that there is really a lot to do there. And, you know, my view is that as we look into the future, there's no difference between a micro business and an online micro business. Every micro business is going to be online, right? That, that's just how people are going to find things. That's just how people are going to want to transact because it's going to be simpler for them and it will allow them to scale in a way that previously they couldn't. In, in terms of the exposure, and I'll just point again, to the steady churn rates at GoDaddy and just the creativity of the customer. And maybe for one click deeper, I'll turn it to Ray and say, Ray, you know, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'll, you know, I mentioned this maybe on the last call, but a lot of our confidence is coming from the recurring nature of the business model. Uh, a couple of things I'd point out uh, to your very point, our core customer is a solopreneur, right? It's one to five employees in a lot of cases. And, you know, when they get knocked down, they get back up. Um, we are providing them all the tools they need for 20, 25 bucks a month. It's an incredibly valuable service to them. Uh, and it's one of the primary reasons our customer retention rate has been so strong for, gosh, 20 plus years now. 
Um, I think folks have consistently gotten it wrong about what's perceived to be as exposure to volatile small businesses. These are entrepreneurs, not necessarily small businesses. So when one fails, they pick up the next idea. Um, Aman hit on the renewal rates. They've been very stable. You know, the, the natural flow of renewal events is roughly evenly spread over the year for us. We're 10 months into, uh, you know, 2020, seven and a half months into the pandemic and renewal rates are holding. So it's instilling confidence in us despite the uncertainty in the market. Great, uh, thanks so much, very helpful. Our next question comes from the line of Brent Phil from Jefferies. Brent, please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, Ray, 11% uh, bookings, I, I know you had a, a tougher 15% comp. I guess with, you know, all the talk of e-com and business apps and more attached, I think maybe some thought you'd see a little more acceleration than that. I'm curious if you can just comment on the puts and takes and kind of what, what you're seeing. I know it, it's all not going to flow in in one quarter, but it seems like directionally you're, you're heading in the right, the right direction. Yeah, Brent, you know, obviously, you recall last year was a really tough comp. There, you know, there was over a point of lift in bookings related to credit card abuse. Um, so I think, one, I would look at net bookings as a cleaner view of the growth, which is closer to 13% year over year. You know, beyond that noise, I mean, Aman hammered it in the, uh, the opening comments. We are seeing historic growth in new customer ads. Um, but remember the new bookings are small relative to the base. It's roughly 10%. So you're not gonna see that inflection immediately, but the, they're super critical for future growth. And there is strong demand for, for uh, our offerings in the market. We're investing to, to maintain that while maintaining our, our threshold. So you saw us pour on the marketing, we're seeing the results of that and new is growing very, very strong. And you've been uh, fairly colorful in past calls, just looking at what's been happening in, inside the quarter and linearity. Was there any color just as it relates to, was it fairly steady uh, improvements throughout the quarter or was it evenly based? How, how, how would you describe the linearity of the quarter into, into the start of this current quarter? Thanks again. Yeah, I'm, I think what I would say is we hit the peak uh, mid-summer the growth rates are still spectacular. I mean, these are record growth rates, but we're starting to see some seasonality, some waning in demand in the market. But, you know, I would still tell you, these are our, our historic growth rates that we're looking at right now. Great, thanks. Bottom line, the, you know, the guide that we put out reflects what we see from a trajectory standpoint for uh, Q4. Our next question comes from the line of Matt Bow from William Blair. Matt, please go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking my question, you guys, and uh, great quarter. I just wanted to ask uh, on the guidance, so full year revenue expectation up a bit from your, your previous expectation and free cash flow expected to be in the sort of middle of the, the prior range. So is this related to you liking what you're seeing from the increased marketing spend and, and continuing to lean into that? Or is there something else going on? And, and then on gross margins, as websites and e-commerce continue to be a faster growing component of your business, how do we think about uh, that impact uh, on the gross margins? Yeah, Matt, on the, the revenue growth, glad you're noticing. We're happy with what we're seeing there from an acceleration uh, perspective. And what we've messaged in the past remains true. Um, any upside we see in cash flow, we're putting back into the business. Uh, we invested a lot in marketing this quarter. We'll invest again in the fourth quarter. And we're going to continue to lean in there as long as we're seeing the returns. Uh, on gross margins, um, don't forget, you know, Q2 was weighed down by the COVID impacts of the top line with, you know, honestly, no relief in cost as we maintain salaries across the board. Um, Q3 does include a benefit now consolidating GoDaddy registry, right? We talked about that acquisition and the benefits there of eliminating the domain cost that we formally paid out uh, to an external party. Um, my, my final thought on gross margins though, right? We've consistently messaged for forward modeling, keep us both safe by staying in that mid sixties. Um, yes, you're right. As we move more into these 
software centric offerings, those are higher margin, but we're continuing to put more into that bundle uh, and we want to maintain the flexibility, flexibility on pricing. So I think it's still mid 60s is a good place for your models. Great. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Our next question comes from the line of Mark Mahaney from RBC Capital Markets. Mark, please go ahead. Okay, uh, two questions. One, any more color on the marketing that you're talking about? Um, and uh, are, there, uh, are there channels that are working better for you than those in the past? I think in the middle of the year, there was probably some very good ROI out there to be had of those, uh, you know, with uh, kind of a, a pullback in marketing from a lot of different verticals. Uh, I assume that the ROI has become a little bit more um, back to pre-COVID uh, norms, but just talk about what you're seeing in terms of ROI and in channels. And then one other question related to marketing, and that is the uh, lapsed customers, uh, you know, customers that were on the GoDaddy platform in the past. Have you had much success during this kind of time of uh, what must be really elevated demand for digital presence solutions. Have you had success being able to go back to some of those last, last customers and getting them to re-engage with GoDaddy? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, regarding the first part of your question on the marketing cost and the return we're seeing, you know, we continue to see strength on the brand side as we have historically core metrics uh, like aided, unaided brand awareness consideration you know, something we measure, which is, you know, for people like me, we continue to see sort of good performance and numbers heading in the right direction. Uh, our performance marketing, can, you know, continues to show strength as well. Uh, you're right, you know, they, there were some differences in the quarter and, you know, cost per impressions have, have gone up a bit, but we're still seeing good cost per impression um, for the business as a whole. And the overall result, you know, as we mentioned, it has been amazing. We, you know, we've had a have a super valuable cohort. It's the biggest cohort in the company's history, which is the third quarter cohort. And it's not just because, you know, we're growing um, every quarter or every year. This this cohort is 30% sort of more valuable than other cohorts. So it's really, really a big increase in what we're seeing. In, in terms of the LAPS customers, you know, as we talked about, uh, a lot of our customers, you know, stay with us even after their ventures uh, ventures go away. So we some of that happens within our system already. It's it's not new, but I'm not I'm not aware of anything special in terms of that changing during COVID. But I'll turn it to Ray to see if there's something he wants to mention about that. Yeah, Mark, let me put a little finer point on that. The the growth in new purchases from the existing base uh, is up year over year relative to the trend before COVID. Not as high as we're seeing, uh, certainly in the new new customers, uh, but still solid growth year over year. So uh, definitely de uh, demand spiked as well in the existing base. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question comes from the line of Mark Zagotowitz from Rosenblatt Securities. Mark, please go ahead. Mark, please unmute your line. Sorry about that. Uh, a couple questions on uh, W plus M, and I got on the call just a little late, so I apologize if uh, this question was also already asked. But just on on the freemium uh, side of things, uh, I was curious what the read is initially uh, on conversion and what uh, sort of the dynamics that you're seeing. I know it's been uh, I guess a couple quarters now. Um, just uh, sort of your thoughts on how that model's played out and the future. And then uh, second one is just uh, in terms of trajectory, revenue trajectory of W. Uh, plus M over the next 12 months. Is there a greater pricing uh, component in the, you know, I guess pricing unit mix equation? Um, and is that sort of required as you think about uh, your comps uh, that you, uh, you know, obviously uh, will be heading up against the summer comps, if, if you will? Is, that, is there a necessarily a greater pricing uh, uh, mix necessary? Uh, appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, on the freemium piece, yes, we're a couple of quarters in, and uh, it's given us the confidence, or the experiment has given us the confidence to continue to roll out freemium. Uh, it's still early to talk about specific metrics um, on that on those cohorts, uh, but generally, we're happy with the experiment. This is the path forward for us, and we want more and more and more customers to be using our freemium products, and we will get better and better and better at converting them uh, over time. You know, the the more 
uh, feature set that we're including in the freemium product, sort of the more usage we see, you know, we'll be able to optimize a number of things over time. In terms of pricing and, you know, I, I don't think we can comment much in terms of what pricing actions might be there in the, you know, going into next year or what we need to do, but I'll turn it to Ray to see if uh, there's some commentary that he wants to include here. Yeah, Mark, I think if you look at the disclosures we made this quarter around those products, um, there's a mix of both volume, um, you know, unit growth, as well as positive mix. Um, the the uh, percentage of customers coming in at the higher tiers uh, has been favorable since COVID hit. So that's helping as well. But uh, yeah, no comments, specific comments around what that will look like in the next 12 months. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from the line of Deepak Mathavanan from Barclays. Deepak, please go ahead. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Great. Um, two questions. So first on the e-commerce side, you've obviously improved the product pretty nicely, added a lot of feature set, and also have done a lot of integrations. When should we expect modernization initiatives, particularly in areas like payment, shipping, you know, potentially partnerships on fulfillment? and uh, sourcing in a lot of other areas where some of your peers you know, generate nice revenues. And then um, the second question is uh, you know, a, little bit, uh, a little bit related to the customer cohorts. Given the big renewal base, it's somewhat harder for us to parse out, but can you provide some color on the quality of our customers that you have seen over the last you know, three, four months in the more recent cohorts? How much is the ARPU higher compared to your typical customer? You know, what's the term like and what are the additional products that they are buying? Thanks. Yeah, if, uh, maybe I'll take the first and Ray can take the second. Um, on the e-commerce side, you know, websites plus marketing is growing amazingly well uh, by itself. And the commerce tier is growing much faster than websites plus marketing overall. So, you know, yes, we, we're improved. we've improved the product. We continue to invest in it. And, we're seeing good results there, good demand from customers there. In terms of monetization options, uh, Deepak, the, the focus for us right now is to get to scale, right? We, we have a great offering by, by making it easier for customers to use, by getting them premium tiers, by inserting more and more capabilities for them, by increasing usage like Mal, increasing the use of certain features. We are creating that surplus for the customer. And Definitely, you know, the areas that you talked about continue to be future opportunities for us, but it's an order of operations. You know, first we want to get the scale and we share the GMV numbers with you, and then we want to look at the future options of monetization. And then I'll turn it to Ray for the second question. Yeah, obviously we talked about the size of the cohorts uh, that we've seen over the last couple of quarters uh, being historically uh, largest we've seen. Um, it, it, as far as performance, you know, still really early to be able to tell how they're going to perform over the longer period. We, we flashed up, you know, a cohort we picked up in the Great Recession in 2008. And you can see the long-term performance on that turned out to be, you know, right in line with other cohorts. So I have no reason to suspect these cohorts are going to perform any differently, but we'll see over time. Uh, I, I, one thing I would point out is in these cohorts post-COVID, we are seeing a heavier mix of attachment for website plus marketing and managed WordPress. All right, thanks Ray, thanks Mon. Our next question comes from the line of Brent Bracelin from Piper Sandler. Brent, please go ahead. Good afternoon and uh, thanks for taking the question here. Uh, I had two if you could, um, certainly appreciate the, uh, the record uh, you know, customer growth you're seeing, but if I look at international in particular, it's the uh, highest growth rate we've seen in, in a year, uh, two quarters of accelerating international growth. Could you just provide a little more color on, as you think about this, 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 this record, really strong customer growth, how much of it is coming from international uh, and maybe what countries you're seeing adoption uh, drive this acceleration? Yeah, Brent, it's broad-based, right? We started uh, increasing the spend on marketing when we saw demand spike uh, back in you know, May, June timeframe. Uh, and that was pretty, pretty evenly split domestic and international. So the incremental spend is going towards both of those and obviously seeing some nice improvement uh, in trajectory there. Um, nothing specific to any one geo, it's strong around the world. 
Okay, that's super helpful. And then just one quick follow-up as we think about kind of ARR. I think you talked about that $350 million ARR business growing 40% year over year. How should we think about that growth profile on an organic basis? I assume there's some some acquisition kind of revenue in there. So as you just think about ARR, kind of organic growth potential, how should we kind of think about that go forward? Guys, vast majority of that's organic. Right? Those acquisitions uh, were both small uh, on, a, on an ARR basis, less than 5%. Okay, great. Super encouraging. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Navid Khan from Truist. Navid, please go ahead. I think Navid, uh, we're going to have to skip you for a second. Um, our next question comes to the line of Chris Kuntarich. Chris, please go ahead with your question um, from G uh, Deutsche Bank. Apologies. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, maybe just on one of your milestones, you guys talked about uh, business apps customers now over 3 million. So that's roughly, uh, give or take, mid-teens uh, percentage of your total customers. And I think back in 2015, you had talked about a, roughly a third of your customers were buying hosting. So, so maybe two questions around that. So first being, is a third of customers um, purchasing hosting from you guys still the right way to think about it? And then second, on, on business apps, how would you think about the opportunity to kind of close that penetration of your customers uh, to more maybe in line with where uh, hosting penetration is with your customers? Thanks. Yeah, I think, um, Chris, you know, we continue to see great growth with, with business apps. And, you know, that we, we're able to attach that product along with domains. We're able to have customers reach us. And we're offering sort of best-in-class service for them, offering for them, both in terms of tool set and in terms of support. You know, it's hard for me to talk about, you know, how the percentages may line up over the next few years. But generally speaking, we feel we have a great product. We, we feel that customers are very appreciative to have it. We see really good responses in terms of NPS from customers on this product set. So we, we, our intention is to continue to invest into it and make it easier and easier for customers to use. You know, we, we've had a couple of sort of innovative ways of being able to support customers so that customers can get themselves set up with email in, in a really, really simple way. Um, and then I don't know, Ray, if there's anything else. Uh, there, some of the other comparisons, I, I don't know, Chris, that you can sort of, they're kind of apples and oranges in my mind, but Ray, I don't know what you'd add. Yeah, I, Chris, only thing I might put on top of that is that, you know, our focus, both from a product perspective and go to market right now, is on those software products, right? Websites plus marketing and manage WordPress, and then all of the marketing tools that go in with that uh, marketing commerce tool. So less focused on hosting, whereas, you know, we, we may have quoted that years ago, um, we now have more prominent software products that we're pushing on the go-to-market. Got it, appreciate the color. You bet. Our next question comes from the line of Drew Glasser from JP Morgan. Drew, please go ahead. Hey, this is Drew on First Sterling. Um, so another question on the hosting area. So given the positive results in hosting and presence, do you think that you guys have hit the bottom in that segment and could we see improved growth in that segment going forward? Yeah, Drew, it's Ray. Um, you know, obviously we saw nice improvement, a lot of that being driven off the back of uh, the growth in our software products there. Um, still seeing headwinds and will until we lap the restructuring actions we took in June. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think uh, all, all clear as far as, you know, uh, the, the pressure we're seeing there. Okay, got it. And then secondly, so we're seeing a surge in new business applications according to some government data. Are you guys seeing that benefit your business at all or could that start benefiting it in coming quarters? Yeah, I, I think the fact that we had a record organic net customer ad this qu this quarter in the company's history tells you a lot. So we are seeing that demand. Got it, thank you. Our next line, our next question comes to the line of Navid Khan from Truist. Navid, please go ahead.
I think we don't have audio from Navid, so apologies. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining our call today. And I'll turn it back over to Amon. Thank you, Christy. Uh, you know, I'll just say a huge thank you to all GoDaddy employees all over the world for a strong quarter. Um, and we're looking forward to the next quarter. Thank you very much.